yield back. Thank you. I'll now recognize Mr. Gonzalez for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you everybody for being here for this important hearing. Uh, I want to focus the, at least the beginning of my time on adaptation and resiliency. I think, um, it, unfortunately, it seems like there's a lot that's sort of locked in that, that we're, we're going to be dealing with over the, over the next however many years. Um, and I'll start with Dr. Pfeffer. Uh, what are you seeing or, or what guidance can you give us with respect to making sure that uh, we can adapt as sea levels rise um, and that we're building more resilient infrastructure? As I mentioned in my early comments, I really am concerned with, uh, in the work that I've done in the, the near term, the next 30, 40, 50 years, where this whole constellation of, of factors um, has to be considered. One of the uh, very interesting and extended conversations that I had is with a man named David Bihar, who works for the uh, San Francisco um, the city, city of San Francisco as a coastal engineer. And one of the problems that they have to deal with are, a, it's a very large dike system, um, basically surrounds San Francisco Bay. And they need to know how far do they have to raise this, this dike system, which is extremely expensive. It's in the, it's in the billions of dollars for a very uh, small rise. And so it was not adequate to um, simply say, well, let's just be safe and figure on 10 feet of sea level rise. And then you, know, then you, know, and you only get one foot and you've spent an awful lot of money. Yeah. In the same sense, um, one of the questions, and this goes back to an earlier question about how many people may be, may be displaced by sea level rise. If you take an uh, a overly conservative number, meaning let's, let's take worst case scenario, and you draw a line on the coast saying, okay, this is going to be inundated by such and such a date. What happens to the value of those homes on the basis of that line that you've drawn? And the nearer in time you get, the more important that becomes. So you really have to have a tight bound on sea level rise and a tighter bound to the nearer to the present that you get. We don't really have that. Yet. In some places we do, and it, is, it very often is a group of scientists that live in a particular region, like Hudson River, for example, yep. um, or, um, well, San Francisco Bay is another example, where you can look at all of the, um, the, the, the causes of sea level rise, including things like um, isostatic depression or rebound in an area as partly as a result of large-scale things like ice sheets disappearing 20,000 years ago, and partly at local things like putting buildings on that land. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of different factors that have to be considered, and different time scales, you deal with different, different factors. And I think it's another thing that points to this interagency collaboration. Got it. But one of the things that I've tried to emphasize in the past is there's, a, there's, a, a, there's certainly a cost to neglecting sea level rise, but there's also a cost to overestimate. Yeah, and I think that's actually a really important point is, you know, when we talk about resiliency and adaptation, I, there is a cost to all of this, right? And yeah. we have to, we can't completely ignore that. We can't be too conservative or too aggressive or, right. or you know, we're gonna be wasting a lot of money. Um, Dr. Wolken, if I could shift to you quickly. Um, in your testimony, you mentioned that in Alaska, there are only three long-term continuous records of glacier mass for the entire state. Considering remote sensing and computer modeling are used to predict future scenarios due to the lack of ground-based observational data, how reliable and accurate are remote sensors and computer modeling in measuring glacial melt and predicting future changes? Yeah, we're doing really well with these different tools. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that, that you can envision is if you go to the hardware store and you get a laser range finder, for instance, from... Uh, the shelf and you know you do some home renovations at your house well that laser is actually quite accurate it's a laser and it's very precise and accurate and and we use tools like that to really gauge how the ice is responding uh, we use other remote sensing tools to do similar things to see how much it's changing in this direction and those are incredibly useful and that's how we do things we do those with both air airborne and satellite based assets um, there is a need in 
places like Alaska, where the topography is so extreme and where the changes are so great, to actually have ground observations. And so when you're using these different remote sensing tools, the resolution isn't quite there some of the times. And so having ground observations to validate in some way or to correct in other ways is really the way to go. And so more ground observations truly do help us. In lack, with, with a lack of that, we have no option but to use the tools that are in front of us and really remote sensing based opportunities are, are where it's at for us. Great, thank you and I yield back. Thank you. I'll now recognize Dr. Foster for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd like to thank 